a very good evening from team Rajasthan of Thalmological Society. This is our uh, second master class on applied refraction by Dr. Krishna Prasad, sir. The Kaksha series has been visualized by uh, the president, chairman, scientific committee, secretary and treasurer of ROS along with the entire committee to benefit the young, uh, uh, you know, upcoming uh, budding ophthalmologists of the state. And it is going to uh, tackle all the basic subjects followed by the more uh, difficult, um, uh, you know, topics. And I would uh, be uh, very happy to share that we had our first session on 14th of uh, December, which was the last Wednesday. A lot of uh, enthusiastic uh, students had joined last year. Uh, last month, uh, last week, sorry, and uh, uh, they there was a quiz also, and uh, now um, I would like to share about a little about our guest speaker today. Dr. Krishna Prasad sir is the director and head of pediatric ophthalmology uh, from M M Joshi Eye Institute, which is a, a super specialty institute in North Karnataka, and he he was um, the he is the director of postgraduate training and fellowship programs at M M Joshi Eye Institute. In fact, it's one of the very good institutes to try for a fellowship if any of the has an opportunity in future. Sir is an alumnus of um, RP Center aims with the uh, honors and he's also done his uh, um, fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology from Storm Eye Institute, Medical University of South Carolina, United States of America. And uh, sir has uh, been in on many, you know, uh, forums of uh, national importance in various uh, Course. Along with that, sir has also been, uh, you know, one of the pillars of postgraduate teaching in India. Uh, he he has been teaching students since last more than 25 years, and uh, we are very glad to have sir with us today evening. Uh, a warm welcome to you, sir, from ROS Executive, uh, as well as the students of Rajasthan uh, Rajasthan of Thalmological Society who has joined today. And uh, a small update that the 14th uh, of uh, December uh, quiz was uh, having two grand winners, Dr. Ishita from Mahatma Gandhi Medical College, Jaipur, and Dr. Sangam, who's from Government Medical College, Kota. So congratulations to the winners. You would be getting your prizes very soon. And uh, uh, now the panelists for today would be introduced by uh, beginning by Dr. Gulam Ali, sir, who's the executive uh, secretary of uh, Rajasthan of Thermological Society. Uh, good evening, Dr. Krishna Pashat, and uh, good evening to all participant and uh, panelists from Rajasthan. And uh, I request Dr. Krishna Pashat, you should start uh, the class of today. Thank and you, sir. We are eager to waiting for this uh, class from oh. last week. I learned a lot from your last class, actually. Thank you so I much. I think uh, learning is never stopped. Na? Uh, <laughs> I am a lifelong learner, actually. <laughs> So I'll uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Team Rajasthan of Thalmic Society and all the enthusiastic postgraduates and my the best friends at Rajasthan who have been very kind enough to include me for the uh, inaugural uh, class as well as the second one. So this we are going to we had some basics. Now it is an applied refraction. We are going to have some uh, the the usage of uh, the knowledge of refraction in our day to day practice. Okay, just a small recap from last time. So you can actually see the, uh, it's plus four at the vertical and plus three at the horizontal. That's just to wake up all the postgraduates because when they see the cross, they normally wake up, they remember the exam and wake up. So the working distance is two third meters and the dry refraction. So just for the people who have joined late last time or are not attended. So whenever you have such a thing, ask for a working distance and dry refraction. Working distance two third meters means you need to subtract 1.5 adapters subtract from one meridian that is plus three if you subtract it becomes plus 1.5 sphere so always subtract from one meridian only and put it as the sphere and the difference between the two meridia from this to this along the number line becomes the cylindrical number so from plus three to plus four it is you have to move plus one so that becomes the cylinder and since it is working at 90, you have to put the axis as 180. So it becomes plus 1.5 sphere, one cylinder at 180. It doesn't end here. You need to tell us what kind of astigmatism it is. So it is both plus 
and so this is actually a compound hyperopic astigmatism and a plus cylinder at 180. I told you to remember minus at 180 plus at 90 is with the rule. So this becomes against the rule astigmatism. <laughs> So, uh, just a few things about uh, uh, the definition. See, this is a very common thing. People ask you, what is myopia? So, when you define myopia, see, why I'm giving you this very basic definition is, normally when we ask the postgraduate, they will say, it's a type of error of refraction in which the parallel right days tend to focus in front of the retina. But what is very important in the definition is when the accommodation is at rest. So that has to be always included in the myopia. And you have axial, you have curvature myopia, you have index myopia, you have positional myopia. Axial myopia is because of the elongation of the eyeball, which is a normally a developmental myopia in children and adolescents. Curvature myopia is basically because of the curvature. The examples that you give are usually keratoconus, keratoglobus, and lenticonus. Okay, so these are the three uh, examples of curvature myopia. Index myopia, see normally the lens sclerosis or the hardening of the lens increases the refractive index of the core of the nucleus. That causes a myopic shift called the index myopia, which is a forerunner of a cataractus changes in most people. And what is positional myopia? Positional myopia is when the structures of the eye, especially the, the uh, crystalline lens or the, the pseudophagic lens, moves forward then it causes a myopic shift. So this is very common. Whenever you have a post-trapeculectomy, okay, there is a shallowing of AC and the lens moves forward. The crystalline lens moves forward. It goes for a myopic shift. Okay, even if there is a pseudophakia, which is uh, normally placed anteriorly, then there will be a myopic shift. So this is the, similarly, if you have hypermetropia, you also need to tell the same thing when the parallel light rays focus behind the retina, when the accommodation is dressed. Again, you have axial hypermetropia, curvature hypermetropia, you have index hypermetropia also, and you have positional hypermetropia also. If the eyeball is too small, you have axial hypermetropia. If the cornea is too flat, like cornea plana, then you have hypermetropic shift. Index, there are certain situations, especially in diabetics, where the cortical part of the lens becomes more dense than the central core because of the glycemic fluctuation. There can be a transient hyperopic shift because of this. So that is an example of an index hypermetropia. So if a patient who is emetrope today, if he comes with plus one hyperopia next week, if he's a diabetic, please check his glycemic control. Normally, it will be going through the roof. Positionally, if the lens moves backwards, for example, the, the, the zonules are 2 lakhs, the bag is 2 lakhs. If you put a lens and the lens moves, leans backwards, it becomes laid back, then you can actually have a hyperopic shift. So remember this. And definition, you have with the rule, astigmatism against the rule or oblique astigmatism. It is always that you have with the rule, the vertical meridian is steeper and against the rule, the horizontal meridian is uh, steeper. Oblique is one where there is a 90-180 coordination, but it is not the horizontal and the vertical. So this is the oblique astigmatism. You also have regular, irregular. You have simple, compound and mixed depending upon, okay, what is the most common uh, thing. So like how do we, so now we come to the most crux of the issue. Last time I told you we're going to discuss this Presbyopia is an universal phenomenon. Everybody gets presbyopia, most people, and it's one of the most annoying thing. In the last 15, 20 years, it has assumed more importance. You know why? It is because of the smartphone use. Earlier, people who are not reading were not much worried by presbyopia. Now, every person, literate or otherwise, we will use a, a mobile phone and that becomes an important, this presbyopia becomes a very important entity nowadays. So now presbyopia, and there are a lot of people presently, I mean, young people or middle-aged people who do not tolerate, you know, presbyopic correction. They want to have a good quality of life without the dependence on glasses. So there is a push towards, you know, correcting presbyopia surgically. So you're all young people. There are a lot of postgraduates in this platform. 
by the time you become active practitioners, there will be another wave. So we have a cataract wave, we have the refractive surgery wave, the prisbyopia surgery wave will be the next big wave you are going to ride. So please understand refraction well because you are going to be the custodians of vision of all the patients who are badly suffering from prisbyopia. So, but how do we prescribe that? So there are two important techniques. The most practical technique, which will avoid overcorrection and undercorrections, the theoretical method using the near point of accommodation. So every postgraduate should know these two things. Okay, so let me come to the most practical technique. If I ask you a post, I ask a postgraduate, let us say, normally they think that it should be prescribed by the age. Never you have to, I mean, think that you can prescribe prosperity correction by age. It's not, that is not the way it is because it's individualistic. Every person's physiology is different. Every person's, I mean, uh, the way the ciliary body contract is different. So you, you cannot standardize the age effect on the ciliary body function. So what are the most practical method? For example, if you are giving prisbyopic correction, there's always a possibility of overcorrection or undercorrection. How does that happen? Let us say a person comes, he is 6'6 six, six for distance and N10 for near. So he is complaining that he is a prisbyopic, he cannot see near vision. Maybe he is 45 years old. Okay, when he comes, we normally give the least plus. For example, we give plus 0.75. And he will read N6. So if you prescribe plus 0.75, we will be under correcting it. It's for a simple reason. Because when he reads the chart, he is using all of his accommodation that is available with him okay, to read N6. But that is not the way it has to be. For example, if somebody can uh, lift you know, 50 kg's weight, putting all his effort, you can't expect him to lift 50 kg weight throughout the day. Some accommodation has to be kept in reserve to have comfort. So whenever we, re we ask the patient to read the near vision chart in the clinic, there's always a possibility that he will actually try to impress you putting all his accommodation at work and that can go for, you know, we may end up in under corrections. Okay. So that is one problem. Second is over correction. For example, the same person you give plus one, he will read N6. If you give 1.5 also, he will read N6. If you give plus two also, he will read N6. So you may actually overcorrect at that point of time and he will not be able to use that plus two throughout the day. So how do we do that? So it's a very simple thing. What you need to do is just, you know, give the least hyperopic correction. Let's say. And then try to just check. If you bring the the point of regard or whatever the reading material that you are checking at the working distance, slightly in front of that, like try to move it around three inches in front of the working distance. Then if it becomes blurred, then you have undercorrected him. Okay. At the same time, from the working distance, if you take it backwards, like three inches behind, away from the patient, then when it becomes blurred, then you have overcorrected him. So the person has to move the reading material over six inches on either side of the, uh, I mean, the uh, working distance. If it remains clear, then probably that is the right correction. Okay. So you should always, whatever is the power that you are prescribing, it should pass this test. It should not become blurred when it is slightly moved forward. It should not become when it moved forward, I mean, backwards. So that you know that he is able to see over a range, which is the physiological thing, which is the most practical thing that we that we normally need. So there is no single nomogram or a chart by which you can prescribe. It has to be trial and error. You should keep the working distance in mind. You should also see what is the uh, I mean the uh, uh, normally the way the patient sits, where is the table, what is the thing that he do, what is the profession of the patient. All those things have to be kept in mind. And the theoretical method is actually very simple. You just have to check the near point of accommodation of the patient. So what is near point of accommodation? It is the point closest to the eye that can be seen clearly with maximum accommodation. For example, if this patient, the same example, 45-year-old person, 
N10, 6, 6. And so he comes for you. You check his near point of accommodation. Let us say he can read, okay, around up to 25 centimeters clearly. His near point of accommodation is 25 centimeters. So how do we check? How do we now know the amplitude of accommodation? It is 100 divided by near point of accommodation in centimeters. So 100 by 25 becomes 4. So he has four diopters of accommodation, which is a present in this person who has come with his presbyopic complaints. That means normally we have to keep around 25% of his near of his amplitude unused. So that he will have to away so that he can actually use that in case of an emergency, whenever he is supposed to see the very closer objects. So the point is, if he sees N6 with plus 0.75, then you add this one, his correction will be plus 1.75. So that will be the thing. So plus 1.75 will be the correction because you need to add 25% of his amplitude of accommodation, which is calculated by the near point of accommodation. So, you basically, this is a very theoretical method, but it actually makes a difference. It makes sense that you, you need to understand that you have to always keep some accommodation and unutilized for emergency so that he will not have the asthenopia or using the 100% accommodation that he has all the time. So, this is a simple method of presbyopia. At the same time, you all should know if a person does not want to wear glasses, what are the options you have? Normally, we say it as clearer techniques, which are now obsolete now, cornea-based techniques, lens-based techniques. So there are a lot of cornea-based techniques nowadays available and lens-based techniques are available. So how do you prescribe a low vision aid? See, this is another very important underutilized aspect of our refraction knowledge. There are a lot of patients who have macular problems, retinal conditions, denegative conditions, corneal opacities, where the vision is very poor and we cannot actually, I mean, uh, increase the, uh, the uh, vision of the patient with normal glasses, <clears throat> normal methods. Then you need to use low vision aids, which are special spectacles, which magnify the image. It is very easy to give a, prescribe a low vision aid for near. Most people want to read so you can, any patient who has a subnormal vision, you should always try to give a near low vision aid so that you can make him happy. So for postgraduates, the simplest thing is high plus lenses. So if you give high plus lenses, you are magnifying the, sub, the, the image that patient wants to see. And this is the simplest low vision aid. Okay. See, normally you give plus 2 or plus 2.5, plus 3 for the near ad. But if you hike it up, plus 4, plus 5, plus 6, you actually, it becomes a simple low vision aid. I'm not talking about more complicated ones. Okay, so how much low vision aid you can give or how to give, there's a method by Kestenbaum. It's called Kestenbaum's method. It's very simple. So if the vision of the patient is 6 by 60, okay, just make the reciprocal of it. 60 by 6 becomes 10. That means you need to give plus 10 for as a low vision aid for a patient who has got six, 6 by 60. So taking his distant vision, the best corrected visual acuity, you do a reciprocal of it, that will be the near vision ad that can give him an N6 vision. But so if you are, what is the problem that you give a high plus lens? So when you give a high plus lens, what is the problem? Okay, so I think I will ask this question for a uh, uh, for the price. So all the postgraduates who want to answer this can unmute yourself and add. What is the problem when you give a high plus lens as a low vision aid? Anyone? Any postgraduate who can? answer this question, please unmute and answer. You will be getting a prize next time. Dr. Sonia. Parabolic vision. Parabola. The patient starts seeing uh, the world like a parabola. 
No. Uh, if you could just first introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Dr. Ankita from Ames, Patna. Sorry, Ankita, that is not the answer. When you give a high plus lens as a near ad to anyone, what is the most common problem the patient is going to suffer from? Anybody? Yeah. Yes, Sandam? Medical aberrations? No. I think you're all... Medical aberrations? Please first introduce yourself. Whosoever is um, answering, first introduce yourself. Thereafter, begin answering. Looking at your name, we may still award you a prize. Who knows? Is your bloodiness or strain of the eye? No. Okay. Medical aberration. No, 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 no. It's very simple. See. Okay, okay. I think uh, answer time is over. Answer time. Nobody gets it. You will, you will wait for the next chance. See, whenever you give a high plus lens as a near ad, you don't have to accommodate. When you don't accommodate, convergence won't happen. Okay. So that means the patient will have a convergence insufficiency or something like an exo deviation. So the patient will have diplopia, cross diplopia. For example, you all can try this. Just put on a trial frame on you. Put plus 10, plus 10, try to read something. You will have diplopia. You will have severe asthenopia because the eyes are not converging. Whenever you read, your eyes converge, you accommodate as a synchinesis. But when you put plus 10, you need not accommodate and you cannot accommodate to see clearly. You have to relax your accommodation. When you relax your accommodation, the convergence won't happen. You will have a severe convergence insufficiency which is similar to exo deviation causing cross diplopia. Okay. So this is the problem with all high plus correction. You all remember when you started doing your microsurgery for the first time, some of you had diplopia. You know why? The answer is very simple. We have two types of convergence, which is normally used. There are four types, but two types. One is accommodative convergence. Other is fusional convergence. And most of us, have poor fusional convergence and we will be using our accommodative convergence. Whenever you are on a binocular microscope, it's a high plus situation. It's a convex set of convex lenses. You, need, you should not accommodate and you will not accommodate when you see through a microscope. So when you don't accommodate, the convergence suffers and you have to use your fusional convergence to make the two images as one. So some of you, till you get used to that, you will have double vision because your accommodative convergence is not put into work. So whenever you have a high plus situation, you have to add a prism to it. Okay. So you will have to have a prism to it. So you have to, for example, if you are giving eight diopters, okay, uh, glasses to both. Okay. You need to add a prism to it so that you have to shift the visual axis accordingly so that your convergence is not put into a lot of stress. Okay. So you also, there is a method to discover, find out how much prism should be added. So it's very simple. You need to add plus two to the correction. For example, if it is eight diopters, add two, it becomes 10. So you need to put a basin prisms in both eyes of 10 prism diopters. And basin prism is the relieving prism for exo deviation. And that is how we use it in low vision aids. So you all should know high plus lenses act like very good low vision aids. And whenever you are using a high plus convex lens, you always have to use a prism to relieve the convergence problem. And it is always basic. Okay. So you should also know for your basic thing, LASIK. So now the question comes, you have what is called LASIK. L-A-S-E-K. Right? So, now this is the question for a prize. Who can tell me what is the expansion of the acronym LASEC? L-A-S-E-K. Laser, laser assisted keratomyelitis. I think nobody I told your name first. So, we don't know who answered this. Okay. You have to first introduce yourself before answering. Please follow this simple rule. I'm Dr. Ayush from JLN Ajmer. 
it is laser assisted sub epithelial keratomeduses okay okay so uh we will uh, hold it for some time so it's laser assisted sub epithelial keratomeduses there is a difference between the two and there is what is called epilasic so it is uh, basically a uh, lasic with epithelial microkeratome and we have prk photorefractive keratectomy we have femtolasic where we use the femtosecond laser to make the flaps we also have a smile so you should know so you are the young people who are going to rule this world of refractive surgery tomorrow right please get interested in refractive surgery just like we have lot of indians who want to get cataract surgery done by you we have lot of people who wear glasses the refractive error is a big problem and getting a refractive surgery will be a life changing for the young people so you need to understand all this so we will probably come to this little later so so we have this question okay this is not for any price the convergence is induced while using synaptophore is accommodative convergence proximal convergence tonic convergence fusional convergence so i will tell you the answer these are the four types of convergence you should know we have four different varieties of convergence the fusional convergence whenever you have a disparity the brain uses its ability to fuse the two images so this is called fusional convergence this is happening at the cortical level accommodative convergence there has to be one more m in this you have to accommodate one more m in this so the accommodation is double c double m so accommodative convergence is the convergence that happens whenever you accommodate as a sync kinesis and it happens by a fixed ratio which is called ac by a ratio tonic convergence is basically the normal tone of medial rectus itself causes some amount of convergence which is not of any actual consequence practically and the proximal convergence is whenever you have the awareness of a nearness of an object you feel suddenly an object is close by you suddenly tend to converge okay which happens with whenever you are checking a patient on synaptophore the patient instead of looking through the synaptophore tubings he actually looks at the synaptophore and that can cause a convergence so that's called prox proximal convergence so of the two the proximal and tonic are not important accommodative convergence and fusional convergence are the two things which are very important and you should if you have a good fusional convergence then you will have very good asthenopia free life okay so now so this is the question i want to ask you so be ready you have to introduce yourself and answer the question i want to so just a b c d that's all okay a b c d so now tell me what is the answer sir dr ayushi gupta a anybody else any takers <clears throat> can you explain this ayushi why yes sir so because when silicon oil is spilled uh, the velocity of sound waves will be very slow so uh, machine will assume that the axial length to be longer than normal so the power which will be calculated which uh, will be less can you tell so me what is the relative speed of sound okay in uh, normal i vitreous as well as in silicon oil So one five zero six. I'm not sure, sir. This is the speed of sound you are talking. Yes, sir. Speed of sound is three hundred meters per second. No. Yes, sir. Ah, that was in air. Okay, in air sound travels three hundred meters, but in in solid media like in vitreous, okay, it travels at around thousand five hundred and fifty meters per second. Yes, Whereas if it is silicon oil. This, it slows down. It slows down to thousand hundred and fifty, so that there is a slowing retardation of the sound waves. So the I is considered to be longer than what it is actually. So you end up putting a lower power lens, and normally you have a, in the, this is plus four. What I have told is in considering that I has a normal size, normal axial length range, it will be around plus four. So I think uh, Dr. Sonal. uh dr ayushi sharma should get the prize she is one of the contenders for the prize next time you can please note this 
and a very well right, answered sir, i have noted dr ayushi gupta right yes yes ma'am yes. okay 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 so this is uh, the this is not for any prize so the main reason for moving from astigmatic incision procedure to toric eye wall see now you have so many what are the different uh, ways by which you can actually correct the astigmatism in cataract surgery so always you should answer okay keeping both phaco and sics in mind not just phaco alone number 1 number 2 start with the simplest thing that you can do then go along so you can actually change this into two uh, astigmatic uh, incision procedures as always chase the steep axis okay wherever is the steep axis normally in an against the rule astigmatism the steep axis is always horizontal okay that is 0180 so you if you are doing doing a scleral tunnel you need to take the incision on the temporal side okay if you take it on the superior side you are going to increase the astigmatism further if it's a with the rule astigmatism you have to take it so chase the steep axis number 2 you can also do an opposite clear corneal incision occi another incision on the other side to further accentuate the flattening you can also do limbal relaxing incisions it's a paired cut or a circumferential cut along the limbus okay which is can run for anywhere from 30 to 60 degrees paired incision which is straddling the steep axis so that you causes flattening of the cornea in that meridian we can also do arcuate keratotomies which are in the mid cornea okay it is at the mid cornea you do two arcs paired arc again so all these incisions we can do and reduce the astigmatism but people like us say you please do a toric eye wall okay don't do incisions let us use a toric eye wall what could be the main reason market pressures cost of incisional procedures incision always results in corneal ectasia and increase in the higher order aberrations okay this is not for price but can anybody can answer a b c d which is the correct answer according to you so is it because of market pressure no sir c it is not c you been always it because ectasia d yeah it is d obviously see basically whenever you cut the cornea you introduce higher order aberrations okay there will be a lot of uh, coma trifold that has introduced a lot of uh, okay irregular astigmatism because of uneven healing so incisions on the cornea have to be minimized because you may have the flattening on the keratometry but you will have a very high higher order, higher order aberration score on the aberrometry the patient will lose the quality of vision he may see 66 but he will not see very well on the pellirobsen chart where the aberrations are plenty okay so that is the reason why we don't want to do any arcuate keratotomies or limbal relaxing incisions we would like to use a toric lens because toric lens is a way of correcting the corneal astigmatism in the iol plane okay so this is what you should actually understand and you all should move towards doing toric iols in future and not depend on astigmatic uh, incisional procedures okay so this is another thing the strategy for managing near vision problems after cataract surgery or accommodative eye wells trifocal eye wells monovision strategy and all the above obviously the answer here is all the above so monovision is one principle where you make one eye emetro the other eye myo usually the non dominant eye is made myo and the dominant eye made emetro with the present biometry techniques and the present eye wall formula we are able to actually hit the bull's eye and create a very successful monovision strategy okay so this is actually dr sonal this will be a, a question for the prize so you have to just tell a b c d okay the so patient... first we'll ask the uh, residents to introduce themselves okay sure now let me give the question i mean first i'll put the options and then they can answer they can so let me explain the patient has a high hypermetropia of plus 8 and he improves to 65 with uh, glasses okay but the patient undergoes lasik his post operative unaided vision will be 618 so what are the likely causes okay 
So once I put the options, you can introduce yourself and answer correctly. A, vision recording is wrong. B, damage to optic nerve due to suction ring. C is loss of magnification of high plus lens and D is diffuse lamellar character. Dr. Sangam C. Ayushi, you will not be answering any more further. Dr. Ayushi, you will not be answering any more further. Even Dr. Sangam also has got the prize last time. Yes, so Dr. Sangam, Dr. Ayushi and Dr. Ishita um, will not be answering right now. Others are open to answers. Would Dr. Aditi like to try? Dr. Ragunandan Khandelwal again. You can try to answer, but um, no negative you have marking, to be no. a member of Rajasthan. Okay, then I'll take up the uh, explanation. So obviously. So here it's a very uh, a normal situation that we see day in and day out. The patients who undergo myopic classic are extremely happy. The patients who undergo hyperopic classic are not so happy. The reason is very simple. Myopia, people wear concave glasses. There is a minification that happens. So the minification reduces their best corrected visual acuity with glasses. And whenever you do a myopic classic, the number goes away, the minification goes, the patient who is 6'6 six, six actually improves to 6'5 because there is no minification effect of thick minus glasses. The reverse happens in hyperops. A patient who is wearing hyperopic correction is using plus correction. In fact, his vision is erroneously high. Somebody whose vision is 6'9 with let's say plus 8, his vision will be 6'5. Because there's a magnification of the Snellers chart because of the concave convex lenses. So whenever you do a LASIK or you do a secondary eye oil in an aphakic patient, the vision actually drops. So the post-op unaided vision can be 618 or 612, which is much less than the BCVA with convex glasses. So this is because there is a loss of magnification by the high plus lenses. So this is something that you all should know. So you can actually have uh, myopic patients happier compared to hyperopic patients whenever you are doing a laser vision correction. So with this, we uh, finish the first part and now I'll be uh, going to the second part, which is a very important uh, aspect for postgraduates. Are you seeing this uh, slide, Dr. Sonal? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. yes, sir. The slide is visible. Please carry okay. on. So I'll just give you some clinical pearls uh, for the postgraduates. Uh, so about hyperopia. See, understand hyperopia is a very difficult situation than myopia whenever it comes to clinical refraction because it's most common. You all agree it's most common? No. People say myopia is more common. You don't see so many hyperopics coming to the clinic than myopes. Hyperopia is common in occurrence, but we don't see it because people have accommodation. By we accommodating, they can actually take care of their hyperopia. In actual incidence, hyperopia is the most common thing. But people accommodate and they make up for the uh, hyperopia, so they don't come to you for glasses. So this whole accommodation business makes this hyperopia business very, very complicated. Okay, so you should understand how accommodation affects hyperopia and its correction. So there are different subtypes. See, hyperopia, last time I told you, you have latent hyperopia, which is basically the part of hyperopia which is corrected by the normal tone of accommodation. And in routine practice, it has no any significance or importance. Only when you put a cycloplegic, this latent hypermetropia becomes evident. So when you use a cycloplegia in a refraction, in an objective refraction, you subtract one for atropine, half for homotropine and cyclopentolate, that is latent hypermetropia. Okay. And it is not always plus one. In a young patient, it can be even 1.5 for atropine. In a little older patient, 
it can be less than one for atropine. So, but routinely we say one for atropine, half diopter for homotropine or cyclopentolate. Okay. Whereas leaving the latent hypermetropia, rest all is called manifest hypermetropia. The manifest hypermetropia again is divided into facultative and absolute. The facultative one is that part of hypermetropia which can be corrected by faculty of accommodation. And that part of hypermetropia which is left uncorrected even after fully accommodating is called absolute hypermetropia. Okay. The children, most of the hypermetropia is covered by accommodation. So they have more facultative hypermetropia than absolute hypermetropia. Okay. So as the age advances, more and more facultative hypermetropia tends to become absolute hypermetropia. And there comes the problem. Okay. So this is something that you all should know. And this understanding makes things simpler and you will be able to actually understand the problems of a hyperopia in evolution. A hyperope at birth, normally in childhood, can have a lot of problems as he grows into an adolescent and middle-aged and they can develop presbyopia early and all the other problems. Okay. See, accommodation will add convex power to the whole eye system or plus power. It can nullify or even completely reduce hyperopia. It can also go overboard and cause pseudomyopia. In a patient who is emmetrope, in a patient who is actually uh, even hypero, you can actually get myopic refraction. Right? If a patient comes, a child comes, and he's got minus four, you give glasses. The patient comes next day and says, I can't see. Then you do refraction. If you do auto it will be minus six. So whatever minus power you give, okay, it is always varying. If you put cycloplegia, you find that he's emetro. All that he's doing is his accommodation gone for a spasm and he is actually having a pseudomyopia because of spasm of unrelieved accommodation. Okay. And this accommodation always comes down with age and you can measure the amplitude of accommodation at each age and it differs at different ages. So how do we measure that? It's very simply that. So you can, you need to measure the near point of, you have to measure the near point of accommodation. So near point of accommodation using either a scale or we have various rulers or rules that are available. Okay. So RAF rule is one of them. So you can measure the near point of accommodation in centimeters. Okay. And that you can divide 100 by that becomes near point of accommodation. Okay. And next is fogging. I think last time I told you about fogging, just a word about fogging because it is so important and the postgraduates get really get fogged by this whole concept. It is very useful in the in relaxing accommodation during subjective refraction. So you have to relax accommodation in people. It's very active. So if you put plus lens, okay, normally plus peers, usually plus one to plus 1.5. So this is a normal thing that you put for fogging. And it requires a lot of patience because the patient has to relax his accommodation. Unless he relaxes the accommodation, the fogging will be of no use. And it takes time. If you just put plus one, he will not relax the accommodation. You need to force him to see through that try to see clearly whenever he by trial and error he comes to know that whenever he is relaxing accommodation he is able to see clearly and if he accommodates he will see more blurred so that's why he prevents or that prevents him from accommodating more okay and last time i told you about binocular balance the same thing if you accommodating asymmetrically like right eye left eye checking separately okay so you need to do a binocular balance how do you do that you put a vertical prism separate the two eyes uh, Snellers chart and try to compare between the two using a by I mean vertical prism so that you cause a vertical diplopia the right eye looking at one chart left eye looking at another chart and you should go and try this it's one of the most elegant techniques okay so now comes the vertex distance see this is a very important aspect for postgraduates to understand the vertex distance is the distance at which the spectacle is sitting from the eye. Okay, as it in a frame or in your trial frame. Okay, so that is the vertex distance. See, normally 
the power of glasses depends on where it is situated see if you have a telescope or if you have a, a you know a, a system of lenses the distance between the different lenses will decide where the formation of image happens so if you move the uh, lenses away or towards the eye it can actually change the whole refractive outcome okay so where does it important what it, choosing the right lens power for example if you use a trial frame on the patient and the trial frame is so small that it's sitting at around 10 millimeters from the patient's eye when you are checking the subjective correction. Let us say you give minus 5 to the patient <coughs> or plus 5. And the patient, you write a prescription of minus 5. The patient goes to the optical shop and tries to choose a special frame which he likes and it is sitting at 14 millimeters from the eye. The minus 5 that you gave at plus 10 millimeters will be completely different at 14 millimeters. So he will have a series of problems because the vertex distance has not been standardized. So it's always important that you need to mention the vertex distance and in very strange frames which are sitting too close to the eye, too much away from the eye. And also you should look at the patient's face. If the patient has a very big nose or a long nose or a very deformed face or a strange facial features, his spectacles have to be chosen with care and with caution. You need to step in and try to ask him to choose the frame and see that the vertex distance is maintained, especially in high powers. In low powers, it just may not matter much because the difference will be too less. Okay. At the same time, what is the importance of vertex distance in routine life? Let me tell you, if you have a patient, okay, for a cataract surgery and you have planned plus 25 adapters to be put in the bag and there's a PC rent and you decide to put a lens, a three-piece lens in the sulcus, okay, you can't put the same plus 25, you will normally undercorrect because a lens in the sulcus and a lens in the bag of the same power will have different refractive effect. So you always undercorrect because as the eye moves away from the nodal point, a convex lens, it becomes more powerful. So a lens in the bag, which is plus 25, will be a plus 20, uh, 23.5 or 24 in the sulcus. Then it may become around plus 13 on the cornea as a contact lens. It will be around plus 10 or plus 11 are awake glasses. So as it moves away, as your patient is wearing a spectacle, the same spectacle at around, let us say, 20 millimeters from the eye, a very unusual vertex distance, it may be even plus 7. So you need to understand when the con convex lenses okay, become more powerful when they move away from the eye. And that is why... So whenever you are trying to correct, I will give you a normal nomogram or a something to remember. This is up to seven diopters of the eye oil power, you don't have to change the power from sulcus to the back. From seven to 17 diopters, you can reduce half diopter from sulcus to the back. From 17 to 27, you need to actually um, subtract one diopter. And more than 27, you need to subtract 1.5 diopters. So this is something that you need to know. And even when you are doing contact lens calculation, a patient who is wearing minus 10 spectacles will require a minus 9 contact lens. Okay. So this is how it is. Okay. You need to understand why vertex distance is so important and how it can be a cause of concern. And a patient can come with problematic spectacles and when you troubleshoot it. The next is about decentration of glasses. You prescribe glasses, the patient goes back, goes and collects the glasses and starts wearing it. And he says that I'm not able to see well. I'm having a lot of stress and I feel okay giddy after when I'm wearing it and I feel spatially disoriented. So he'll have all types of complaints and he thinks that you have given him wrong glasses. Okay. He goes to the optical person and he checks it on the lens of it and says, sir, as, it's as per the prescription. The doctor, you go back to the doctor and he comes and you find that you have not done anything wrong, but the patient is not happy with the spectacles. So this is because you have only checked the IO, the power of the spectacle. You have not checked whether it is properly centered. To have a clear 
vision, the optical center of the spectacle has to coincide with the pupillary axis or the center of the cornea or the visual axis. If it does not, then the patient will have a prismatic effect and he will have a lot of problems, especially if it is a high number and also has a cylindrical correction. So how to check the decentration of glasses? So if the glasses are decentered, the problem is not yours. The problem again goes back to the optical person. Okay. So how do we check the decentered glasses? The most common annoying complaint and patients are highly dissatisfied, especially in the present era where they spend a lot of money on that. And it is very common with high corrections. So let me give you an idea. So this is how you do a, how to check this. So if you are just seeing the, just keep the whole the spectacle against anything which is horizontally oriented. For example, if you are seeing through this, there is a, a small, so you try to arrange in such a way that they both become in one line. For example, it becomes a line, you draw a line, take a sketch pen, draw a line on the spectacle. Okay. The outside line and the inside line should be oriented. Then you turn it by 90 degrees and again you draw a line in the same way. So when you have a vertical and a horizontal line where they intersect, that is the optical center. So we just by holding the spectacle against, you know, uh, just hold it along anything that is horizontally placed, just keep it and draw a line. Keep it by 90 degrees and draw a line. So you get the optical center and you ask the patient to wear it. The intersection of these two should actually coincide the uh, his visual axis. It should be in the center of the cornea. If his cornea is somewhere and this intersection is somewhere, then the problem lies with making of the spectacles. The spectacles have not been cut properly, keeping the patient's IPD or interpupillary distance in mind. And that will take the owners away from you and the optical shop person has to probably make it again. Okay. So that is why you always have to mention the interpupillary distance in your spectacle so that you will not be held responsible for a dissatisfied patient. Okay. So this is a simple way of trying to know how the glasses are decentered. Okay. And now we have so many patients who are undergoing laser vision correction, LASIK, smile, and so many things. Okay, they are all adolescents, they are middle aged people, and all of them will get cataract sooner or later. Okay, because some of the myopes do develop cataract by 45, 50, 60. And we, the refractive surgery started in uh, uh, around 20, 25 years ago, and now we are already getting some of the patients, the early birds who got I mean, laser vision correction, like PRKs and LASIKs, early LASIKs, they are coming with cataract now for cataract surgery. By the time you are in all busy practice, you will have a lot of patients who will have come with a previous refractive surgery and doing a cataract on them is going to be a challenging job. So every time we do this. So how do we achieve emetropia in a post-refractive surgery patient? So it's an emerging problem. You all will be facing it much more than we people. And there's an unpredictable outcome in the refractive status. Actually, you should understand it is not like any other patient. You can't just do a biometry and do the cataract surgery and expect emetropia. And there is an evolving thing. So much is information is told about it. So you should understand, at least in simple terms, how to do it. There are some basic things. I will actually explain you. I will not go into detail. At least know some names for the exam and for your practical life, okay? So what happens, so the whole question is, what happens in a post-refractive surgery patient? What is different life from a normal patient? A normal patient with cataract comes and you do a keratometry, you do an axial length evaluation, put an eye oil formula, get the eye oil and put it. But what happens in a refractive surgery patient? They always end up with a post-op hyperopic error. Just like Dr. Ayushi answered, in a silicone oil field eye, if you don't take care, you end up with a hyperopic error. Similarly, all patients of post-refractive error surgery, if you do not understand and do it like any other routine patient, you end up with hyperopic error. Okay, why? There are two reasons. Number one, there's a kerat keratometric error in assuming the central corneal power. The central cornea, we are talking about myopia. So the, myo the central cornea is flatter 
and we always extrapolate the central corneal power. We always measure the, the paracentral part of the keratometry and we assume the central part is steeper than the paracentral part. So this assumption or extrapolation causes, assumes, the keratometry assumes a higher power than, but the central cornea is flatter. So we end up with hyperopia. At the same time, even the corneal flattening will also result in a wrong prediction of the uh, estimated lens position or effective lens position. So the two reasons why they end up with hyperopia is we should understand we never measure the central corneal power directly. All keratometers measure the paracentral part. If the paracentral part is 42, it assumes the central to be 44 by a simple assumption or extrapolation. But in a myopic classic, the paracentral part is 42, the central part is 40, not 44. It has become flatter. So there is a wrong assumption and we always end up uh, basically making a, assume, making a higher calculation for keratometry than what it is. Okay, so now we'll come to the uh, proper, uh, no, the basic part. How to power the eyeball power calculation in a post refractive surgery patient? There are a lot of said about it, but I will try to simplify for a postgraduate. If the previous clinical data is available, or if the data is not available, you have patients wherein they have all the data. What is their previous, uh, you know, uh, refractive error? What was their keratometry? What was their SIMK? What was their axial length? You have all the data. In some patients come with no data. They have no idea what they underwent. They just know we underwent a laser for Cheshma number and they have no data with them. Okay. So it is very important that whenever you are doing a laser vision correction, you should provide all the previous clinical data to the patient. Tell them in future, you are going to need this when you get a cataract. Okay. So when no data is available, so let's say previous data is available, then you have basically three methods clinical history method okay and this is very uh, fees manis method is a very elegant method and you have a topographic corneal power method so these are the three things that you should know and clinical history method clinical history method is the most simple and probably the uh, you can just do a reverse engineering so this is keratometry the previous keratometry you know what was the previous keratometry of the patient. You want to know the keratometry of today, the real keratometry. Okay, you don't want to measure by a keratometer and get fooled. So, but the previous keratometry, you have the data. And you have the spherical equivalent previously. You know the, the myopic error the patient had previous to the laser vision correction. And the spherical equivalent now, whether it is emetropia or myopia or hyperopia, what is the present refraction? Okay, you need to put and you get the keratometry after or the what K you need it. I'll give a small example. Let us say the pre lasic the keratometry was 44, 44. And the patient had minus 6 power. And presently he's a metro. Okay, this is a standard thing. 44 was the pre lasic keratometry. And he had minus 6. And he has become a metro now. It's very simple. 44 is the Pre previous keratometry and his spherical equivalent is minus 6 and uh, this is 0. So, 38 would be the present keratometry. So, it's very simple. All the 6 diopters of myopia that got corrected is basically arising from the cornea. His cornea was 44. It became flatter by 6 diopters. Now, it is 38. Okay, simple. So, this is something very, very elementary and simple that you can use clinical history method. And fees manis is an another calculation where if you know the IOL power pre -lassic, you have to do a biometry of on all the patient undergoing refractive surgery, give it to the patient. So if you know the IOL power pre -lassic, okay, and the that plus the change in the refraction divided by 0.7 becomes the IOL post -lassic. Let me give an example. Let us say in a myo, they had done a biometry, his eyeball power came to be 15 diopters. He was not undergoing cataract surgery, but they had done a biometry. And he has now 7 diopters. He was minus 7, now he's 0. Or he was minus 8, now he's minus 1. So the change in the refraction is 7. So 15 plus 7 by 0. 0.7. So 15 plus 10, 25 diopters will be his present eyeball power 
that will be required for the cataract surgery which he is undergoing presently. Okay, so Fismanis is another method. If you know the preoperative biometry, then you will be able to get the present biometry. Okay, and if you have a Zeiss topography, you can have a pre elastic corneal power minus change in the refraction into 0.15 minus 0 0.005. This will be the plastic adjusted post operative corneal power. So, this is another method by which, if you know the pre elastic corneal power, minus change in the refraction, whatever the refraction, into 0.15. Okay. And this, if you subtract by 0 0.05, will be the total power post classic. You need to convert it into diopters later. Okay. But if you also have patients where there is no clinical data available. Okay. Patient just come without any data. So you have a hard contact lens method. You have modified Maloney's method. Okay. These are the two methods that you need to understand. Okay, so hard contact method is very simple. You use a hard contact lens of a known base curve. Okay, and you should know the power of the contact lens. It can be zero or any power. And the spherical equivalent, okay, after wearing contact, before wearing contact lens and after wearing contact lens. So I'll just give an example. Let us say we take a hard contact lens of 40 adapters base curve and which has zero power. Okay, we have chosen a zero power contact lens. When you put the contact lens, the refraction is minus three and without contact lens, the patient is a metropole. Okay. Like post cataract, post refractive surgery has become a metro. So it is 40 plus zero minus three minus zero. It will be 37 diopters. So you have to put the hard contact lens, do the refraction. And then this is the way you need to calculate. So if you do not have any previous data. Okay. And this is the simplest. If you are, do not know, you do the central corneal power on the topography. You take the Zeiss topographer, which is normally gives a CCP. You take the cursor onto the center. It gives the central value. That into 1.11 will minus 6.1 diopters, which is the posterior uh, spherical corneal uh, I mean, uh, sphericity. You get the post classic corneal power. So modified Melanie's technique is the simplest if you have the topographer, which gives you central corneal power. Now comes a very specific situation where you have a radial keratotomy. Luckily, you don't see much of it now. We have already thought that wave is over because in 70s and 80s and 90s, early 90s, we had a lot of RKs being done where you know, radial cuts on the near full thickness cuts in the mid-peripheral cornea were done, which caused a nectasia of the mid-peripheral cornea and flattening of the central cornea. If you get a patient with a radial keratotomy, Okay, there is a change in the both anterior and posterior curvature. That is the problem. If you have laser vision correction, only the anterior curvature changes, posterior curvature does not change. Whereas in radial keratotomy, both will change because you are done almost a near, nearly full thickness thing. And always there is a post operative hyperopic shift. It's a typical situation. You do a cataract surgery with a patient of RK. Let us say you have done, done the keratometry and done it and you have done an IOL, which is a metrope now. After 6 to 12 weeks, okay, the patient becomes hyperopic by around two diopters because the further ectasia happens, the central cornea, post cataract surgery, the central cornea further becomes flat. So if you are managing a patient of post RK, always increase the power by two diopters so that the hyperopic shift is taken care of after three months. Okay, this is a very important thing that you should know. Okay, and presently, if you have a swept source-based OCT <coughs> biometry, you normally do not have such problems. And it has got the, one of the finest you know, keratometries and it takes care of everything. It has got its own. You can actually use the... So this is untreated. So if you can just uh, change it to, let us say, Instead of untreated, you can actually use the LASIK and it can become, uh, if you use that, you will, you can choose the LASIK. So you don't have to worry about all this. Whatever I told you need not be done. If you have a swept source based OCT biometry, like a IOL Master 700 or a Lenstar 900, you can just choose LASIK. It will take care of all the things that I have told you. 
Okay, so presently you don't have to worry about all this if you have the latest gadgets. Okay, so if you are using having a patient coming for cataract surgery with a previous laser vision correction, don't use only one method. Use multiple methods of IOLST cal calculation. And it is very important to have the pre-refractive surgery data at least for future. So always give a patient all the details so that it can be used. And always tell the patient that there will be a refractive surprise and lens-based procedures in future would be more stable and better than, you know, these things. So we will... Uh, I have a very... Uh, how much time do we have, Dr. Sonal? We have another 10 minutes. Yes, sir, you have 10 minutes. So please carry on. So I'll go to the last part. So there are some uh, basic doubts about So I told about we have with the rule and against the rule astigmatism, regular and irregular <coughs> and simple compound mixed. Okay, <clears throat> And a simple example of a simple myopic astigmatism is any number with a minus sign at any axis. Okay, And similarly for uh, a simple hyperopic astigmatism, whereas compound is both are minus, both sphere and the cylinder and the compound hyperopic is both are plus. But this one is not a mixed astigmatism because the cylinder has to be more than the sphere. If you do a transposition, what I told you in the last class, it becomes plus one and plus two. So sphere and so this becomes a compound hyperopic astigmatism. Okay, so remember that for a mixed astigmatism, the cylinder value has to be always more than the sphere. Okay, so this is the mixed astigmatism. Okay, so now, I come to a very important thing, posterior corneal astigmatism. See, this is an entity which most of the postgraduates are not aware of. The posterior, the cornea is a convexo-concave structure. The anterior curvature, what we measure by keratometry, actually is not the anterior curvature. Basically, the anterior curvature is around 50 diopters. And the posterior curvature, which is concave, is around minus 6 diopters. So the effective thing will be 50 minus 6. So it will be around 44. So the posterior corneal power or the curvature always contributes to around minus 6 diopters, which actually negates the anterior one in a small extent. But this is a different thing. Posterior corneal astigmatism is different. It is the asymmetry of the posterior corneal surface. Just like the anterior surface has an asymmetry, the posterior corneal astigmatism also sometimes has an asymmetry. Okay. So now, if you, I just, uh, Dr. Sonal, I want to ask this question. This is a for the prize. What is the effect of posterior corneal astigmatism? when the patient has with the rule as well as against the rule astigmatism. So how much we have to factor in the influence of posterior corneal astigmatism in our routine with the rule and against the rule? Any postgraduate can answer if they know it. Even something which is close to the correct answer can also be awarded. But first, please introduce yourself. Any postgraduate, what is the effect of corneal, posterior corneal astigmatism in our routine refraction or in any case of our refractive surgeries. Okay, I think I'll take this up myself. So basically remember this. Against the rule astigmatism, ATR. So ATR. So always add around 0.3 diopters. Normally the posterior corneal astigmatism is additive to the against the rule astigmatism. That means there is an against the rule astigmatism. The posterior curvature, curvature is usually an against the rule effect. So the normal against the rule effect gets added by around 0.3 diopters, whereas with the rule astigmatism gets reduced by 0.3. 
Okay, so this is the effect. So ATR add 0.3 with the roller stigmatism. W2R subtract 0.3. So this is important. So whenever you are doing any kind of you know corneal surface ablation or any kind of laser vision correction, this PCA also becomes a confounding factor. Okay. So this is another question, Dr. Sonal. You can probably take it up for the prize. I will give you the options and people can answer. Okay. A is plus 4, B is minus 4, C is minus 1, D is a metro. Did they already okay. answer I'm going to tell you before? a silicon uh, oil field eye undergoes a cataract surgery. You do an A scan ultrasound biometry and put plus 21. Okay. Which was supposed to be the emetropic we power. Answered this question what already. What is the post-op refraction? Will it be emetrope? Will it be minus one? Will it be minus four or plus four? You can tell your name and answer. Sir, I think we answered this question already. Hold this. Okay, so this this got over. Sorry, somebody answered this. Sorry, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we'll now come to the. See, most of you will be doing the biometry yourself. I know you, most of you use acoustic A scans. And uh, you will be doing the keratometry and biometry yourself. But let me give you some idea. Like when you're doing biometry, you can produce more accuracy if you take care of few things. Number one, how do you get accurate K readings? Okay. See, the accurate K readings are never do the keratometry on a cornea uh, which, uh, to, into which you have put some drops you have done some contact procedure. If you have done an applanation tonometry, don't do a keratometry for getting an IOL power. It should be done always on the virgin cornea as a first procedure when you actually do things. So no contact procedures and no drops ideally. Especially if the patient has a dry eye or ocular surface problem, always put some artificial tears, ask the patient to blink more often and then if you don't getting the correct Myers, don't try to take those readings. Okay, you can do it on another day because the readings can really become different. So if the patient is a dry eye, you may even get an uh, astigmatism which is not there and you may end up putting a toric lens. Okay, so accurate K readings are very important for the power. At the same time, you can also, I mean, uh, goof up the axis. A patient who is actually very tall, you are trying to fit in. So what happens is he tries to actually fit into the machine and try to crouch over it. He can actually tilt the head. So if there's a tilting of the head in trying to fit into the keratometry machine, you may actually change the axis by 10 to 15 diopters. You may think that the axis instead of 90, you may record it as 75 because the patient is trying to tilt his head. So never allow the tilting of head. Whenever somebody is doing a keratometry, you should watch whether the patient's head is erect so that the 90-180 is taken care of. Okay. So that is how you get accurate K readings and accurate axial length. The axial length is you should try to avoid doing a contact A scan. Immersion A scan is the norm, is the standard of care. If you do an immersion A scan, you will not indent the cornea you will not cause any artifacts in trying to get the axial length. You may indent around 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 millimeters of cornea, which can end up with almost you know, one diopter difference sometimes. So axial length is measured best by optical biometry. If you don't have optical biometry, you should always do an immersion A scan to get axial lengths. And always you can customize the A constant. If a surgeon is doing particular case with a particular A constant, you may have further refine the A constant, not given by the company. You can have what is called a surgeon's constant. So that for a, that particular method, okay, where the lens is sitting, you can further customize the A constant. Okay, And you also should know the special situations like post-LVC and post-silicon oil cases. Okay, so finally, what about, uh, these are the most commonly things asked in the exam as viva, short notes. Okay, you have theoretical and regression formula. SRK1 is the most commonly known, but it should not be used. It's an age-old Stone Age method. Okay, 
so srk1 so now the question comes i think we still have prices and people have not taken prices not answered it so let me ask you a question i mean go ask the post graduates a question dr sonal why i told you are not i am not happy with you people using srk i want the correct specific answer i told you you should not use srk can any post graduate give me the correct answer where Sir, is the problem with this answer before should not answer please introduce yourself and then begin answering and uh, and dr shita pande uh, in srk1 uh, the effective uh, lens so you can try no there is no negative marking so the other criterias are not taken under consideration so, so like the refraction and them up. Uh, effective lens position and all these are not taken into consideration you can guess no why i am not happy with srk formula sir dr no, sangam no actually according to excel lens we have to subtract why we lean upon time. the present formula not the age old srk Actually, types dr ishita was answering in uh, um, so dr sangam started speaking between dr ishita if you can just um, you know enumerate your points quickly again sir could not hear you you are muted dr sangam uh, uh, yes sir uh, sir i was telling that uh, in srk one the other uh, specifications like interior chamber depth and effective lens position as well as the Post of refraction; these are not taken into consideration, and that is why SRK one is obsolete. Okay, let me uh, give you the answer. SRK formula. Okay, there are three things that are important. One is the keratometric power to check the get the eye oil power. Keratometric power. Second is axial length. And third is the distance between the two dual lenses. That is the cornea and the lens, either the crystalline lens or the pseudo fakia. which we call as the post operative ac depth or also called as effective lens position elp all the previous formula assumes elp to be a constant okay it only takes keratometry and axial length elp is taken as a constant so it just assumes it to be something okay so then what happens in extreme situations you always have outliers in which the power you will always get surprises so why the srk formula is not accurate because it assumes elp it does not try to find out the elp or try to refine the elp okay so at least you can answer this and get a question dr sheetal kya ho gaya sabko What is the expansion of the acronym SRK? Not Shahrukh Khan. You have to unmute. The people who are answering should unmute first. Tell your name and answer. Doctor Bagishri, Doctor Ayushi. I can see a lot of residents here. Sonal, you are also muted. Ma'am, can I answer? Yeah, please do. Mam Sanders, Sanders, Crafts, Crafts. Oh, at least you should know this. Those three people have done a lot of work, and they were the pioneers. And we have used uh, all our previous uh, <coughs> cataract surgery using this eye oil part. Is this formula? Anybody? Mam Sanders, Crafts, Crafts. Okay, so that's the right answer, Dr. Ayushi. I think from SMS has given the answer. Dr. Ayushi Ma'am. Gupta also gave the answer, but he has already answered once, so we will not uh, count that one. Okay. So you just have uh, these are modifications, but anyway, uh, you just have to know it for the sake. But presently. we have to go for the further uh, when there is a combination of theoretical and regression srk t holiday 1 and hoffer q were the third generation formula and fourth generation is these are the most important ones remember this holiday 2 barrett's universal haggis olson hill rbf now you have kane formula you have many other things okay so uh, somebody can tell what is special about hill rbf what is what is the what is uh, used in hill rbf to make it an extremely accurate method of eye oil power calculation 
Can sir, you, Ishita Pandey here. It's artificial intelligence. Can you expand? Can you tell a little more, throw some more light on that? Uh, what is artificial so intelligence? They, we always use natural stupidity, but what is this artificial <laughs> intelligence? Sir, all I know is that uh, this is an online calculator and uh, the uh, Hill RBF. Sir, I have used this formula and I know it's from artificial intelligence. I don't really know the exact mechanism. Uh, the K1, K2 along with the degrees are taken into consideration, which is not so in the Barrett's. That is what I found the difference. And even the... <laughs> You answer your viva very well, actually. You can confuse the examiner very well. Okay, let me kind of throw some light on that. Artificial intelligence is simple. For example, if you're doing a predictive, I mean, your predictive testing in your mobile phone is artificial intelligence. Okay, so it basically uses, uses some pattern. It causes a pattern recognition and try to suggest you something. So there are multiple factors in a patient like, you know, keratometric power, white to white, Preoperative AC depth, lens thickness, refractive power, so many things. So there are so many preoperative factors other than axial length and keratometry. And in the combination of all these, what happens to the postoperative eye power? So people have used a particular formula. They have done the surgery. They saw the post-op and they entered back their post-op refractive error. And this data of the post-surgery data, that makes the Hill RBF a fantastic thing because you it refines your IOL power further and it is continuing to do so. Presently, there are 25,000 entries of surgery that have happened. So whenever you put your data in, this formula suggests you something. When this, in such similar cases in this 25,000, they put this, but they got this power. So that you get an idea, what will be the prospective power that you're going to actually end up with. So Hill RBF is an ever evolving formula and it's becoming better day by day. Okay, even Kane formula is similar. So you should know this and Hill RBF will be the future. It is already coming to the gadgets. Okay, so for a short axial length, use Hoffer Q. Normal axial length, Holiday 1 and long axial length, SRKT. For all axial lens, you can use Barrett Universal and Hill RBF. And thankfully, Barrett Universal is available free on ESCRS and ESCRS websites. So if you do not have an optical biometry in your setup, absolutely no problem. Do a keratometry, okay, as the with the, all the precautions I told you, do an ax, I mean uh, immersion A scan. When you do that, also. I mean, uh, enter the lens thickness and the AC depth along with axial length. Go to ESCRS website, go to Barrett's Universal, enter the data, you will get your IOL power, which will be as good as an optical biometry. Okay, this is something that you should know. There is no need to buy an optical biometry for that. And finally, we'll end up with the uh, this final thing, spherical aberration. This is one concept I want to tell you before I close. It is the most common higher order aberrations. It can degrade the image quality. And it can also give you pseudo accommodation in a pseudo faking. For example, even if you have made the, put a monofocal and made him 6'6", six, six, the patient can still see some near, uh, I mean, he can read NA because if he has a spherical aberration, which is corrected. And please remember this, the cornea always has a positive spherical aberration and the crystalline lens in the end has negative spherical aberration. So the effective overall image quality is very good. As the age advances, the crystalline lens turns positive. So that is why we put aspheric lenses in aged people to get back the negative aspericity of the cornea. Okay. So... This can be a question for the prize if you have anything left. The possible reasons for pseudo accommodation, that means the patient seeing clearly for near. Okay, A, B, C, D. What could be the answer D. for? Dr. Sangam D. Dr. Sangam has already sold out, no, last time. The Dr. Siddhi Mathur has answered D. Okay. So let me explain this. 
If you have an uncorrected spherical aberration, small quantity, it actually helps to see read, read small print even with a monofocal eye wall, which is a metro for distance. But the patients people have a small myo, small pupil, no myo, myo, myost pupils. It actually gives a pinhole effect. They can actually have the depth of focus. And usually small amount of myopic astigmatism, which still can give you 6966, they can use it for near. So this is the most common reasons in elderly people who do sometimes don't use glasses for reading, even though they're a metro for distance. Okay. So, so you have multifocals, you have trifocals, and you have updated depth of focus. So I think I'll finish with this. If you are implanting a multifocal, always look at the cornea. The cornea has to be pristine. It should not have any irregular astigmatism. It should not have any kind of higher order aberrations from the cornea. It should not have high cylinder or astigmatism, corneal astigmatism. Otherwise, if it is high, then you need to use a toric multifocal. Okay, this is very, and patient should not have any ocular surface disease like a severe dry eye. Then comes to capsulozonular apparatus. The patient should have a should not have a zonular weakness, and the capsule should not be sick. It should cannot be fibrosed or I mean calcified. The support it should actually be the integrity of the zonular capsular apparatus for a long time is very essential because the tilt of any multifocal induces aberrations and loses the quality of vision. And the third thing is the macula. You cannot have any kind of macular pathology. Your diabetic macular edema, CSME, or any epiretinal membrane, or a macular scar will degrade the image quality, and you cannot have a multifocal. So cornea plane, capsulozonular plane, and macular plane, these three planes have to be checked before you implant a multifocal. Okay. And finally, uh, is there any price left still, Sonal? This is the last question and last slide. You have one more price, right? Okay. So, sir, no more prizes, but you can ask the question, surely. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is the last question. So, a patient actually came, a young boy came, and he was not using any glasses in a school myopia. So, you gave glasses minus three both eyes. Okay, and patient became six six, and you were very happy that you got back the vision of the child. But the mother came back after a week complaining that after he's wearing glasses, he is now squinting. Okay, now he's squinting. You gave him minus three glasses, and the patient now is having ESO deviation. Okay. So, can anybody explain why? Sir, because that time he, maybe, was, he was having heart so not maybe using his uh, Okay. Overcorrected so, glasses, maybe. Over it's not overcorrected. You have, you have corrected it. Glasses are correct. He just had minus three myopia. You have not overcorrected him. He needed minus three, and you have given him minus three. Need to correct excess or cylinder. Okay. Please understand all ESO deviations, fully correct hyperopia, under correct myopia. All exo deviations, under correct hyperopia, and fully correct myopia is the holy grail. The patient, if he has an ESO tendency, for example, this patient had an esophoria and he had myopia. So he was not using his accommodation. So he had eyes straight. You gave him minus three. Now you have activated his accommodation. He starts accommodating for near. And this accommodative convergence has now unsettled the balance. And he starts now deviating. The esophoria becomes an esotropia. Similarly for exodivision. A patient may have intermittent divergent squint well compensated. Okay. Well compensated. And if you give him, let us say, a plus correction, the patient has plus correction. The patient actually was hyperope, not using glasses. So he was accommodating. 
and the accommodative convergence was taking care of his intermittent divergent squint. Now, when you give him plus correction, he need not accommodate his intermittent divergence became really now manifest. Okay, so always remember this. Always do the cover test before you give the glasses. All ESO deviations, fully correct hyperopia and under correct myopia. If he has an esophoria, if he has an exophoria, under correct hyperopia and fully correct myopia, so that you also maintain the ocular balance. Okay, so I think with this, I come to the end of this uh, applied refraction class. I think it has been a wonderful. Uh, audience here and very proactive postgraduates and a very supportive office bearers of uh, uh, ROS. So I again take it as an opportunity and thank everyone for having me for this program for the second time. Thank you so much, Dr. Sonal, Dr. Kamdar and Dr. Porwal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank sir, you. I have one question for you, sir. Please, sir. Uh, there is a lot of corneal degenerations in Rajasthan. So what is your message about the uh, to the resident about these people who need biometry and they have a lot of corneal degeneration? Sir, actually, corneal degenerations, uh, if it is affecting the central cornea, see, normally uh, keratometry, the central cornea is only important. The periphery is not important. If the central cornea is affected by spiroidal degeneration, normally there will be an irregular mice. Okay, so that is one thing. And sometimes there's an asymmetrical involvement. One eye is more affected than the other. You can always try to check the other eye. Thank you. And if they're almost matching, okay, then probably you can take. If the myers are too irregular, okay, then it will be always an approximation. You will never be able to hit the target. At the same time, if the if the already the central cornea is affected by spiroidal degeneration. Even as such, the vision of the patient may not be so good, even if you do the right kind of uh, surgery also. So you may have to call some kind of an optical iridectomy or expand the pupil on the superior side because yeah. the degeneration goes from inferior to superior side. So one, apart from the uh, biometry, one small suggestion is expand the pupil superiorly. Most of these young old people will have senile meiosis. If you do the surgery, the pupil is very small and the spiroidal is right in the center. If you just make a superior cut at 12 o'clock and make the pupil a little pear shaped, then the bright light will not may cause them to go for a meiosis and still they will have some clear area of the cornea through which the light can enter. Very nice. Thanks. Any other Thank questions? So there's been doubt from the audience. Um, yeah. uh, Dr. Ayushi has asked a question that how do we give near correction to a young patient with only one eye being pseudophagic, maybe a traumatic cataract or something, uh, which has led to one eye being pseudophagic. So that's what she's asking. I think uh, it's very simple. See, young people actually uh, can adjust to anything. Anesoconic lenses, anesometropic correction, and all those things. So, if the patient one eye is six six n six, a normal eye, and other eye has got a traumatic cataract, you have done a cataract surgery. Let us say it is is six six for distance. You can always give the normal near correction like an adult, but in the progressive addition lens form, in the progressive as a. So you can give a progressive glasses to one eye, and they do actually coordinate. So we have checked even the stereopsis for near with such unilateral pseudophagic patients and they do very well even on the stereopsis scale. They do get something like 30 seconds of an arc stereopsis. So you can treat it like any other patient and give even one eye near correction, preferably a, a pro progressive glasses. Thanks. Kilnani sir is also there with us if uh, you would like to give a few comments. Hello, sir. Dr. Kildani. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Hello, sir. This time I'm enjoy enjoying from beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Last time you came a little, little late. late. Yeah. Little late. It's a very elaborate, very, very well explained. I'm thankful for you, Dr. Prasad, but I will advise my all the residents to please go back to the book. Yes. Just don't go to sleep and um, read it. Spend few hours with the books 
So whatever Dr. Prasad has told you, will it will be very, very beneficial to you. These are all practical points. They help you a lot in your practice. How to do a biometry, how to correct in a silicon field. I, I being a retinal man, I, I know the importance of that. In the post classic, which is going to be norm in, um, I, I believe in another 10, 15 years. Yes, sir. So thank you very much. I think you can have Dr. Prasad number. If anybody has any doubt, you can always reach him on his... Sure, WhatsApp. sir. Sure, sir. 100%. On, anytime. No problem. On, on behalf of ROS, I express my gratitude to you once again. Thank you very thank you much. So much. Thank you so much. I think you have a person from Rajasthan itself. Dr. Yogesh Shikla's book is extremely, you know, it's a, yes, one yes. of the finest compilations on refraction. I think I advise all the postgraduates to have a look at it. It's one of the finest works on refraction. There are multiple books. I think Dr. Shukla's is one of the best. Really? Thank you. Great. We have another master of refraction with us, Dr. Pankaj Sharma, I think. Of course, sir. Pankaj was my senior and he has taught me refraction. So whatever mistakes of mine, you can probably settle with Pankaj. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hmm. He is master of many things, but refraction is <laughs> Back to Sonal, Doctor. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind hmm. comments and giving uh, such a nice uh, you know, speech to encourage all these students to get back to the books. That's very, very important. And like with the advent of so many online classes, I think people read less and less. They just watch videos and and the thing that it has registered, but uh, I'm pretty much old fashioned that way. For me, my notes work best. So, uh, I mean, listening uh, is, is, a, is a tool to aid your, uh, you know, uh, how to uh, get all that knowledge inside. But ultimately, one has to write and read also. So, uh, very nicely pointed out by sir that one should go back to the books. And um, uh, Gulam Ali, sir, if you would like to uh, bid adieu to the uh, audience. No, uh, it's nice uh, learning from Dr. KP, and uh, I think we will uh, uh, plan more classes from Dr. KP in future. Thank you, Dr. KP. Yes, sir. I also deal with many other things other than refraction. People have branded me <laughs> refraction. The one one PG asked me, sir, do you also do cataract surgeries? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it will be very nice to come back to our voice anytime. It's the uh, same old, sure, sure. old people. So thank you so much. Once again, I'm really indebted to you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you also enjoyed the same way. Yes, sir. Enjoyed a lot. Thank you. Good night. Okay. okay. okay good good night. Night. Thank you, everyone. Good night, good night everyone. Thank you, Sonal. Good night. Thank good you, night. sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.